We at St. Joseph's Episcopal Church in Salado, Texas, welcome you to a reading of the scripture for All Saints Day, which is November 1st, 2020. We invite you to pray with us today. If this is your first time hearing us, know that we wish you good health and happiness. We can't wait to meet you in person in our little church in the near future when this pandemic passes. All Saints Day, the Collect. Almighty God, you have knit together your elect in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Give us grace so to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living that we may come to those ineffable effable joys that you have prepared for those who truly love you through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God in glory everlasting. Amen. A reading from the Revelation of John 7, 19 through 17. 9 through 17. I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving, and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one who knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. The lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of water of life and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of the Lord. Psalm 34, verses 1 through 10 and 22. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be ever in my mouth. I will glory in the Lord. Let the humble hear and rejoice. Proclaim with me the greatness of the Lord. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me out of all my terror. Look upon him and be radiant, and let not your faces be ashamed. I called in my affliction, and the Lord heard me and saved me from all my troubles. The angel of the Lord encompasses those who fear him, and he will deliver them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are they who trust in him. Fear the Lord, you that are his saints. For those who fear him lack nothing. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack nothing that is good. The Lord ransoms the life of his servants and none will be punished who trust in him. A reading from the first letter of John 3, 1 through 3. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. That is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew 5, 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who, have persecu who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of the Lord. The Sermon for All Saints Day, November 1st, 2020. The title is Immortal Love. Something unimaginably deep in each of us wants to believe that we're more than the sum of our parts. After we've been tested and graded in schools, evaluated repeatedly for job qualifications, scrutinized by the opposite gender for physical attractiveness and marital worthiness, assessed our own personal value according to the way other people respond to us, gotten the results of a lifetime of medical tests. After all of that assessment and evaluation, and much more, day by day, minute by minute, we still have a sense that there's something more to us, something that hasn't ever been captured by the familiar meets and bounds of life on earth, something that we can't even imagine death can erase. Human beings have always been this way. I can't answer whether my cat feels like there's something more to her than kitty treats, neck scratches, or a good long 23-hour nap. But human beings believed there's something more to us from the beginning. It's why there are over 600 marvelous paintings on cave walls in Lacoe dating from 17,000 years ago. Or why Stonehenge exists at all. The sense that there is more to us has drawn human beings to build unimaginable cathedrals over generations with primitive equipment and to create every work of art ever made. It's what took us to the moon and all the other places where no one has gone before. It's where our ability to conceive and communicate with God originates. The early Christians call that larger self holy, in Latin, sanctus, which gives us our word saint. They lived in their holy greater selves, which was understood to be intrinsic to their membership in the body of Christ. They did not think sainthood's holiness was something any more extraordinary than their lives already were, since just being Christian was an extraordinary risk in those days. Sainthood was their life beyond mere secular living, where Roman authorities deemed them worthy of persecution and execution. They were at home with each other in God. They had to be. They had no alternative. Holiness was as natural as breathing for them. Their secular lives were about pain and being eaten by lions in the arena. We in the 21st century are much more comfortable with our secular existence and thus, it's fair to say, sanctity and sainthood have receded from our normal experience. Our identity doesn't require as the early Christians did, to think of ourselves as saints. In fact, for one of us to make such a claim would be an act of preposterous 
self-promotion. Even in the Middle Ages, when sanctity was a more immediate reality, saints were still considered to be extraordinary people, models of behavior for regular earthbound folk who never dared aspire to sainthood. Then, as now, the only certified saints were long since dead. Anybody walking the earth as a potential saint would be inscrutable to us, identified only after a long, arduous process of canonization far off in the future. Yet, I am haunted by that sense of sainthood in the early church, where saint was a normal title of address, like mister or even comrade in certain circles. They called each other saint, and they meant it because they felt it. But what did they feel? What did it mean? Is such sainthood accessible to us modern secular folk? Louise Gluck, an American poet who won the Nobel Prize for Literature last month, describes, with acute perceptiveness, the outward journey of the soul into holiness in her poem titled Immortal Love. Yet, she has a warning for us. While the soul may be on the path seeking sainthood, it is also a dangerous journey. Like a door, the body opened and the soul looked out, she writes. Timidly at first, then less timidly, until it was safe. Then in hunger it ventured, then in brazen hunger of any desire. The soul is indeed more than the sum of our parts, but that makes it dangerous. The soul more than I can handle. The soul outstrips the brain. Therein lies peril. Gluck's soul, hungry and unmanageable, roams around the world. The soul demands, where is the something more to feed my infinite existence? Struggling to keep up, the brain throws out inadequate, desperate answers. Success, power and dominance, rigid religious doctrines, boundless pleasure, the smile of lady luck, achievements possible only in fantasy, 10% greater annual income. The brain's inadequate attempts to satisfy the soul's longing leads to addiction, abusive behavior, and boundless greed. We lose our souls because of our brain's limitations. At such a moment, Louise Gluck perceptively asks, promiscuous one, how will you find God now? even in the garden you were told to live in the body. If we lose our souls in addiction or greed, the poet asks, how will we find our way to God? How will God find us? The literal reading of the message from the Garden of Eden is, in a word, stay in the body. Don't let your soul roam. Practice self-control. Iron discipline. Resist temptation. Don't be Eve wanting to be like God. And yet, and yet, what if, what if, in Gluck's final words, you believe you have no home since God never meant to contain you? That statement brings us to the question at the center of Christian life a question only Jesus himself will finally answer. If it is dangerous for the soul to venture beyond the body and the brain's ability to reason, where then can the soul go that is safe for the soul to go? Where can the soul go that does not fall into a trap set by the brain? The answer is simple, even obvious once it dawns on you. 
Yet the answer is not always simple to embrace. The simple, obvious answer is the soul can go to other souls. The place where a soul can go safely is to love in its fullest sense. Only other souls are also infinite, holy, sanctified, worthy of engagement outside of all the brain's little cages. This answer was immediately obvious to the earliest Christians swept away by Pentecost. It was similarly obvious to several generations of Christians who came after and defined their communities of souls as the collective body of Christ, a holiness worthy of the risk of their very lives under Roman persecution. What might a corresponding modern community of souls look like? There are many possible answers, but here's one curious way of gaining insight into our modern situation. In the old days of psychology, experimenters used to put lab rats in cages with access to two bottles, one of water, the other of cocaine. Isolated in his cage, the lonely rat invariably chose the cocaine, overdosed in short order, and died. That proves the theory of addiction right there. The poor rat loses his soul if there is such a thing to the greedy pleasures of cocaine. But that's not the end of the story. An experimenter named Bruce Alexander built what he called a rat park. He put a community of lab rats into the rat park, gave them everything a rat could ever want, lovely food, loads of other rats to, def to befriend, colored balls to play with, and two bottles, one of water, the other of cocaine. And guess what? In such a happy community, the rats never chose the cocaine. They didn't need drugs. They had everything they needed in each other. Their little rat souls were satisfied and safe in the company of other little rat souls. Well, this experiment carries a warning for Western Europeans and Americans who live in a hyper-individualistic society, the moral equivalent of individualized rat cages with only water or cocaine to choose from. Because we isolate ourselves emotionally more than we should, we are at risk of taking the addictive option, however it might present itself to us. Individualism can never satisfy the hungry soul. So little lab rat souls give us guidance. If Bruce Alexander's experiment means anything, it tells us that the way out of our dangerously isolated cage is not to take the conservative approach to addiction that blames people for their lack of self-control and moral failure and tells us simply to white-knuckle our resistance. Nor does the liberal approach save us by explaining away addictive behavior as a type of sickness. The rat part tells us that the way out of our cages is to engage one another as souls. Early Christians understood the wisdom of love and lived in its reality because of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Sainthood then, as now, is not something far off and distant, only for extraordinary people certified as saints only after their death. Sainthood is essential, vital for everybody, right here, right now. Without sainthood, we lose our souls. Furthermore, we live in intersecting times for sainthood. COVID creates conditions not unlike Roman persecution. We are all in danger if we venture too far out into the secular world where legionnaires, lions, and viruses lurk. Like the early Christians, we resist exposing ourselves 
to the world outside. But can we, like them, take the next vital step? Can we discover holiness in intensified relationship with those we love? Holiness sufficient to redeem our souls in the face of a hostile world? Can we find our way past our lifetime's training in rugged individualism? Can we find our way to one another's souls, made all the more precious because we can only reach out by phone or internet or sit ten feet apart? Can the energy of our fearsome isolation drive us to one another, opening our eyes and hearts finally and fully to the real necessity of Jesus' last great commandment, that we must love one another as Jesus loved us. Now, of all times, is the time to reach beyond our quarantine and be in touch with other souls we love by whatever means possible. Do you believe, Louise Gluck asks in her final diamond-sharp question, that God never meant to contain you? Christians know that God never meant to contain us in the isolation of our bodies because Jesus lived and preached love with all his soul and being. The sacrificial love of Jesus, which we are meant to embrace with one another, breaks free of individualism and isolation's trap where the only desperate choice is between water and cocaine. The love of Jesus is like a door. The body opened and the soul looked out, timidly at first, then less timidly, until it was safe. God did not create our souls to live isolated in our bodies or in cages or in pandemic isolation, but to live free. The only safe way to live free is in union with other equally holy beings. Nothing less than souls in union with one another and with God is safe. Nothing less fulfills our very existence as souls created in the image of God. This sermon was written by the Reverend David Hoster. Thank you so much. God bless you. And we'll see you soon. We at St. Joseph's Church in Salado, thank you for joining us today. Although we can't greet you in person, we pray daily for you. Our Daughters of the King members accept prayer requests, which you may call in, email, or drop in the box in the chapel. Our office phone is 254 nine four seven three one six zero god loves you and so do we until next week be well <laughs>